Howdy! My name is Kelly Johnson and I work with the PEER program at the College of Veterinary Medicine and Biomedical Sciences here at Texas A&M University. And we've put together a series of training videos to help you with your educational endeavors. So today, one of our veterinarian technicians here at the vet school, Tina Verna, is going to talk about post-operative care in small animals. I'm going to talk to you about post-operative care that goes along with uh, the anesthesia service. When we're done anesthetizing a patient, one of the most critical areas that we get into is waking them up out of anesthesia. And that is, other than at first putting them under anesthesia, waking them up is just as fraught with different, uh, I'm trying to think of the word. Thank you, fraught with different challenges as uh, doing the, uh, the first induction period. So when we first go to wake them up, one of the things that we have to think about is what kind of procedure they had done, how long they've been under anesthesia, if they're cold or not, um, if they have a certain type of structure. So the dogs with a smush face, they're much harder to wake up than those dogs that are normal, like a collie or a, or a lab, uh, Pekingese, uh, English Bulldogs, any of those dogs that have everything that a Labrador have just smushed. I actually own one of those dogs, so he's always fun to anesthetize. Uh, we have to think about that their breathing is going to be much harder to control because they have a lot more tissue in the back of their throats. So when we anesthetize, uh, say a peak or a pug, any type of those breeds, what we always have available are an extra set of endotracheal tubes and we have these just in case that when we extubate them or take the tube out when they're ready that if all of a sudden they can't breathe we'll re-intubate them um, very quickly so that we're controlling their airway and hopefully get them to where they can wake up without having to keep it in place and we do have a few patients that do that uh, then they'll go into an oxygen cage for further post-operative monitoring the other thing that we utilize when we wake them up is a pulse oximeter, which a lot of people will know because if you go to the doctor yourself, a lot of times they'll put one of these on you and it just measures your oxygen saturation. And we'll put it on a dog's tongue or a toe, any place where it will get a reading. And when we put it on there, all it tells us is the heart rate and it will tell us what their oxygen saturation is at that moment. And when they're first waking up, we want them after their tube is pulled out to saturate it about 94%. Um, I am doing fairly well at 97, so. And we'll leave that on until they're warm and comfortable under, um, with their post-operative pain medication. One of the other things that we have to worry about with their airway and breathing is that if they've been on their back for a long time or if they've had their heads tilted down, their face tends to swell, and that happens with anybody. That's why you know, if you stand up on your head for too long, you're, you get all your blood rush to your head. If you stay up long enough, your face will swell. Um, what happens is their noses swell. Dogs don't naturally breathe out of their mouths unless they pant, and cats don't breathe out of their mouths unless they're having a problem. So we'll use a drug called neosinephrine, and it's the same thing that we use when we have a stuffed nose. All we do is we squirt it up their nose so that it can help with any swelling that's up there and allow them to breathe normally. We actually use these on all the horses as well. Um, and the reason we use it on the horses is that anytime that they're anesthetized for any period of time, they're usually on their sides or on their backs and that's not a natural position for horses. So their nasal passages automatically swell and shut. And horses don't breathe from their mouths, they breathe from their nose. And you can tell when they need it because they'll have a snuffly sound like we do when we're sick. So we just squirt a few things of this up there and it solves the problem. You can feel them breathing out their nose. The other thing that's a huge problem for animals when they go under anesthesia, whether it be um, a two pound puppy or a 1200 pound horse, is that they get cold when they're under anesthesia. Anesthesia naturally makes them not control their body temperature. So post-operatively, that's always one of the areas that we fight with is making sure that they get warm and stay warm because they won't wake up nicely if they're not warm. So we have different, different items that we use here at A&M, but in, in private practice, they utilize these products as well. And one is a bear hugger. And this one, just when it plugs in and you put it in, they have these blankets and they're basically kind of hot air balloons. It just blows hot air into it and it 
blows hot air onto the patient while they're in anesthesia, under anesthesia during the surgical procedure as well as when they're in post-operative care while they're waking up. In some patients we have to keep um, a bear hugger on them for up to two hours after surgery depending on how cold they get. Um, patients who have an abdominal procedure and their abdomen is open, it's very hard to keep them warm because all of their intestinal organs are getting cold. Um, horses are horrible to keep warm because they just don't make a bear hugger warm, big enough. <laughs> uh, we do use another product which is called the hot dog and the hot dog is different than the bear hugger because the bear hugger uses hot air and this is more like a hot heating pad. It's a little different. Heating pads typically have wires in them which could create hot spots and it can be dangerous because dogs can't tell us when it's too hot. People can and they'll move away from it, but if they're waking up, they can't and they'll get burns. So we use this product um, and the reason we do is the blanket's a little different. It's got a polymer base instead and it's just the, the polymer heats up evenly and the uh, control unit will actually alarm at us if it's overheating so that we can protect the patients. They have little sensor spots on them that will let us know that there's a problem. Uh, and these are also reusable, so we like them here because we can use them from one patient to the next by uh, disinfecting them. And they actually make a blanket that is about as tall as I am and a little bit wider, and we use that on the horses. We put it over their necks and their heads to help keep them all the blood flow warm. Uh, works a little bit. The normal temp that we want them at when they come out of anesthesia is about 98 degrees or higher. The normal body temp is about 100 degrees, but if we're at 98, we're doing a good job. A lot of patients, depending on where they go for, say, a uh, MRI, just like humans, uh, they will actually go into post-op sometimes as low as 90 degrees, which is less than ideal and can be dangerous because if your temperature gets too low, then they can have a problem with the heart. So those are things that we have to think about post-operatively when we go to wake them up is how cold are they and how aggressive do we need to get in warming them up. Then what we can do sometimes is heat up their fluids that we're giving them to heat them from the inside and the outside. So those are a couple of steps that we use. The other thing that we think about when we go into post-operative is before they wake up is a lot of times they've been getting IV fluids, hopefully, and if they have, their bladders are usually big. And the bladder has a bunch of nerves that are connected to it, which are part of the vagus trunk. And the vagus trunk of nerves controls heart rate and respiration. Um, if you have a really big bladder that's pressing on that vagus nerve, it can actually cause a heart rate to go really low. So we usually will express their bladders prior to them waking up to help with that. And then the other thing is so that when they wake up, they don't urinate on themselves, which is always a problem because husbandry is a big deal for our patients. It's uncomfortable for them to lay in their own urine. And if they're waking up, that could be something we have to worry about, especially if they have a wrap or a bandage on their leg because it was a broken leg or we had to fix a knee. The other thing that we do is we wrap their catheters to make sure that they can't uh, dislodge them when they awake. So we'll just wrap their leg around where the catheter site is at to keep it clean and then to also make sure that they don't dislodge it by accident. For our patients, we always make sure that they have analgesia, which is pain control. And then the other thing is to make sure when they wake up out of anesthesia, sometimes they're dysphoric or they don't know where they are. So they'll thrash out or they'll, they'll vocalize and cry, even though they're not really there. So we may use a drug like acepromazine, which is a sedative, just to take the edge off and allow them to wake up a little bit slower from the inhalant or gas that we use, um, which is very typical. And some of the pain drugs that we use will actually cause increased uh, dysphoria or not really knowing and then we'll have to reverse that drug with a different drug that reverses some of the sedation part but we'll leave the pain part in place. So those are the steps that we go through for post-operative anesthesia care. Well we hope you enjoyed that video and on behalf of the entire peer team we wish you the best of luck with your educational endeavors. Don't forget to check out our website at peer.tamu.edu for other training videos and free resources. Thanks again, and we hope to see you soon.